Hello, good morning. Welcome to the very first uh, webinar on the market monitoring report, uh, a report produced together by Acer and SEER. Uh, today we are going to present the key findings on different volumes, uh, electricity wholesale, gas wholesale, and also the, the new energy and retail, energy retail and consumer protection that is uh, putting together what it used to be two volumes in the past. Uh, you can send your questions all through the presentations. Uh, first, I will give the floor to, to Christian Zinkelsen, the director of ACER, and also the moderator of today's webinar. Through the different presentations, you can write on the chat the questions you have. We will group them through the presentations, and there will be a Q&A session just after the commission interventions, where uh, we will try to solve all your questions on these three volumes that we have been producing um, and explain today. So, without further ado, I give the floor to Christian, who will do the initial remarks and moderate the event. Good morning, Christian. Yes, thanks a lot, David, and, and welcome uh, to all those who have chosen to tune in in Europe and possibly beyond Europe uh, for this uh, inaugural webinar of uh, Acer and CER on our marketing um, uh, on our market monitoring report for this year. Uh, we had the pleasure of uh, briefly presenting some of the main conclusions yesterday uh, for the European Parliament, for the ETOC committee. Uh, we were uh, blessed, so to speak, with a lot of engaged, detailed questions, and we hope we can uh, replicate that also this time, obviously benefiting from more time for this webinar uh, than was possible uh, in the presentation before the ETO committee in the parliament. Um, and so we have, I think, uh, roughly 40 minutes actually uh, for the three volumes, uh, gas, gas wholesale, electricity wholesale, and retail markets and consumer protection. David was uh, signaling a little bit how we would go about it. Uh, in a few minutes, uh, we'll kick off, um, go through sort of the main uh, headlines supported by uh, several slides for each of the three volumes, starting with gas wholesale, which uh, Bart Vareke, who is the team leader um, uh, up until recently for market monitoring on gas, now heads our strategy team at Acer, he will go through. Then electricity wholesale uh, highlights will be presented by uh, Rafa, who leads the market monitoring for electricity at Acer. And then um, the head of the Swedish National Regulatory uh, Authority, Energimarkets Inspektionen, and Nilsson will present the third volume uh, of retail markets and consumer protection. Then we have two colleagues from the European Commission, Florian Emmerkora and Jan Panik, who will uh, give their views, their perspectives, if you will, on some of these findings, some of these highlights, how they relate to future EU policy challenges and priorities. They will have uh, roughly 10 minutes for that. And then we have this Q&A round, which David was referring to. Now, don't hold back with posing your questions until the Q&A round. We won't address them until the Q&A round, but feel free to pose them uh, in the chat as David was outlining as you have them. We'll try to group them towards the end, maybe take a few on gas, electricity, retail markets in groups, uh, and then we will try to uh, take them at the end. We aim to have roughly 20 minutes for that. That may not be enough to uh, tackle all questions, but we'll seek to uh, go about it as best we can. And then we have Ingrid Gröbel, who is with the German National Regulatory Authority, uh, Bundesnetzagentur, and president of CIA, who will draw some conclusions and close today's webinar. So that's what you have in store. We aim to uh, let you go, so to speak, unless you let go first, uh, a quarter to 12. Um, and um, hopefully we will have not just an exciting enumeration of highlights for these three volumes uh, this year, but also an opportunity to address uh, some of your uh, questions and comments um, uh, to the extent time allows. With that, uh, David, unless you want to add something here, I would be keen uh, to pass the floor to kick us off uh, to uh, Bart. And Bart, you would take uh, us through uh, some of the key uh, findings uh, on gas wholesale markets um, uh, uh, on our behalf, followed by Rafa subsequently. So I pass you the floor, Bart, uh, to kick us off. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Christian, for this introduction. Uh, I will guide you through uh, the main findings of the gas wholesale piece. Um, of course, you will find more detail in the volume itself. I would also like to tell you that we have a 12-page leaflet summarizing all the points of the full MMR. So. Um, uh, it's impossible to show everything in such a short time span, but um, 
I will try to do my best to give you the main thing. So presentation today is unfortunately not complete to discuss a bit uh, uh, the impact of uh, COVID on uh, among other energy markets. And here for um, gas, we see of course demand and prices have uh, decreased. Uh, but interestingly, from the analysis so far, uh, that's only first half of the year, price convergence levels have maintained, so they don't seem to have been impacted, which uh, is the testimony of the fact that um, markets are quite resilient uh, to shocks uh, in the system. Uh, we'll see how it what brings uh, later uh, to us. So if I um, go to the next page um, to kick us off with um, some of the content, uh, I want to really show this page on uh, LNG. So the bars, uh, they show that uh, LNG landings have increased quite dramatically in 2019 and up to first half of 2020. Um, this is very important because LNG as a marginal price setter in Europe for gas supply uh, is now quite core to the price formation in uh, gas markets and is expected to continue. So prices have uh, decreased and of course um, uh, this of co is of course linked to evolutions in the international markets and especially what's happening in uh, East Asia there's an interaction there in landings of LNG, whether they go to Asia or to us. Uh, and that of course is price uh, specific. Um, this is important, um, I guess, given that we are very dependent on gas, that is important. Uh, this page, uh, this is the most complicated one, uh, but I promise uh, this will be the only one, so don't run away. Um, shows the supply st status in Europe according to a couple of dimensions. The bubbles are number of sources that a country has where they can get tap into gas. Uh, the horizontal axis is uh, upstream uh, market concentration. And on the left, it means uh, if you would not take into account the uh, dominant source, how well you can still uh, supply. Uh, there has been improvement over the years. Um, you want to be in that uh, blue uh, box that I just uh, indicated. Of course, these are estimates, but uh, the number of countries or markets uh, is increasing over time. So they're already quite uh, a good number. Um, main challenge still is uh, the concentration. So even though overall dependency is decreasing, we still have some concentration challenges. And then if we aggregate at EU level, we see that there has been improvement, sources, um, also concentration levels have decreased, uh, but there is still some way. But it's a good setting for markets to drive in already. Of course, as a result, we always like to show this uh, slide because it shows the supply sourcing cost, also estimates, of course. Um, here, uh, the market's prices have been converging over time. Uh, they have dropped quite a lot, as you can see. Uh, on the top, we take TTF as the benchmark. Uh, the yellow has been expanding a lot. Um, the core thing here is that um, if I uh, look at an annual piece, uh, which 2019, the, the price uh, decreases were quite uh, sudden and quick. And then the more mature markets in Northwest Europe could tap into that uh, more quickly and others became uh, a bit more bluish again, but we expect that they can tap into that later. Um, there is some more long-term contracts uh, that uh, these markets have. So it takes a bit more time before market events uh, take control or have an impact across the board. But overall, uh, positive evolution also at hub level. Um, I'm not showing you charts here, but it's uh, the convergence uh, is quite high, especially in Northwest European hubs where uh, up to 90% of the time, uh, the delta or the spread is uh, less than one euro per megawatt hour. 
And then we have some differences across the, the hubs with a bit lower uh, convergence levels, uh, regional differences for various uh, reasons, but it really is also a positive indication uh, which makes us moving into the next uh, page. Uh, I lost control over the slide or it doesn't shift and now it does, sorry for that. Um, the hubs, the gas hubs, um, we always do a ranking of them based mainly on uh, remit uh, data. Remit is a database where all transactions are being recorded uh, in a confidential matter, so we sanitize this to a large degree and it's based around 10 to 15 metrics and then we rank. It's of course not uh, uh, pure science, but we see that over time we have more and more uh, more advanced hubs, a couple of well-established ones. There is still, of course, uh, work to be done in terms of improvements. Um, the delta between weaker performance and better performance is actually, unfortunately, increasing. So it will take some effort to uh, get those hubs, uh, mainly in Southeast Europe, going. Uh, but um, in general, um, for 2019 differences versus 2018, NPP uh, continues to decline a bit, uh, also taking the Belgian hub in its uh, course, given that they are very linked. Spain, Hungary, and were very performing well, and in general, all markets went ahead except for some of those that I mentioned. So. As a conclusion, uh, market rules are working well uh, across Europe, more or less. Uh, there are differences, of course, but in three quarters of the consumption, uh, we can see good market functioning and there is advancement in the others. There are still welfare benefits to be tapped into, of course, but that is uh, a matter, hopefully, of time. Uh, on the next page, um, I show the network codes. Um, no, I have still another one, sorry. TTF. Uh, this is the leading hub in the EU. Uh, there is no discussion about that. It's the European uh, hub of reference. Uh, and it's also attracting more and more forward liquidity from other hubs when we look at these individual metrics that we analyze. So. And on top of that, globally speaking, um, just like Henry Hub in uh, North America, um, it's also becoming a global uh, reference hub for hedging, mainly of uh, LNG. So the scales are, uh, of course, adapted because uh, TTF is so uh, important uh, that uh, we have to change a bit the uh, scales, otherwise some would not be visible anymore. Uh, this is very key to the dynamics uh, in the EU. Uh, on the network codes, uh, these are uh, rules that are supporting actually um, the gas markets. Uh, they have bringing they are bringing a value add uh, to the system. Um, we see positive benefits. Uh, for example, balancing has become more market driven. Um, uh, the TSOs have a lower role. Also, the transparency rules for tariffs, uh, they make it easier for uh, shippers to enter into the market. And then on capacity, we see that um, the more flexible use of the network allocation is uh, also bringing uh, benefits. And I want to show you that in the next uh, page. Uh, this is um, on the left, you see ex post uh, situation and on the right an ex ante situation. So the dark blue are legacy contracts which are over time expiring and they are being replaced uh, via new uh, capacity allocations in line with the regulation. And we see that to a large degree they have been replaced so far remains to be seen if that will be in the future as well. Um, they are replaced by shorter term, like within day, day ahead, month ahead uh, products. So it gives 
So players are reacting to the possibilities and they are aligning to what they need. It gives them more uh, opportunities to do so. On the right, we have analyzed uh, the expiration calendar of the long-term legacy contracts and you see the way in which they will expire. So by 2028, many will be no longer in place. It remains to be seen to what extent they will be replaced, probably not all. This might raise some questions about uh, stranded assets for uh, TSOs. And we also see that uh, on longer term bookings, so yearly, uh, ahead longer term, uh, we see a larger role of the or an interest of upstreamers. So it's a very interesting analysis uh, to be sharing with you. Now, when we look uh, forward uh, in the EU, uh, we are uh, or we have decided to move to a carbon neutral uh, system by 2050. Uh, that means also that there is an important uh, task to move to make ga a gas carbon free. Um, even though there has been advances over the last decade, as you can see, um, the, the relative share of consumption is still uh, relatively small. So that means there's still uh, quite some work to be done. Um, prices, of course, of low carbon are not competitive yet, but overall, when we want to move to this uh, more carbon neutral uh, system uh, we would like to see that uh, the more or less uh, successful system that we have is taken into account or kept to a large extent and that new rules are uh, embedded in that uh, kind of system so that we you know as the americans say uh, if it ain't broke don't uh, don't fix it there's also a role for hydrogen and then uh, some colleagues of us in infrastructure have made a survey on where we stand so we are only at the beginning um, 35 percent allow blending uh, there are strategies being uh, produced but uh, we, we we are still at the start of uh, uh, what could become uh, a bigger thing to reach those uh, targets now, this was my last uh, page. Um, I would like to give the floor to Rafa, who will uh, discuss uh, the electricity wholesale uh, status. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. I hope you can hear me well. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll guide you now through the uh, part of electricity wholesale. Um, I'll try to follow a similar structure as Bart. I will start by highlighting some of the most recent developments, in particular in view of uh, the impact of COVID-19. Then I'll highlight some aspects on which we have observed um, more progress over the last few years, uh, in particular in 2019. And then I'll move to highlight what are the main remaining challenges before moving to conclusions uh, at, towards the end of the presentation. I'll, I'll try to go to the next slide. Yeah. So in terms of uh, the impacts of uh, COVID, uh, well, as in gas, uh, COVID has impacted the markets in many different ways. Uh, the most obvious one is um, decrease of demand, um, together with an important shift uh, in the generation mix, and consequently, a drop in prices. Uh, this drop in prices was at times um, very pronounced. Uh, so it was on average around 30% during the first semester of, uh, of 2020. And in some areas it reached 80%, just to give you an idea of the dimension of the drop, uh, together with the occurrence of some negative prices. A positive development that we have observed, uh, or at least um, a kind of a success successful test is that during this period, uh, TSOs coped, uh, coped with um, uh, high levels of penetration of renewables coupled with low demand and in occasions very few thermal generation units connected and it proved to be successful in terms of managing the system uh, which can be, con can be considered as a positive test for what can be expected more and more in the future. I will move to next slide. Yeah. Um, we can actually 
illustrate graphically these changes, uh, in particular the um, uh, relevant switch uh, in the power mix. Uh, on the one hand, already in 2019, there was a switch from coal to gas, uh, and also from coal to wind and solar, which uh, was above the production with coal. And even more remarkably, during the first semester of 2020, there was the first ever fossil fuels to renewables switch. So this was a, an important highlight uh, of, of the first semester of 2020, which may be more frequent in the future, depending, of course, on the evolution also of the COVID. Uh, but in any case, it's expected to happen more and more in the years to come. If I have to answer now in next slide, uh, the question on whether um, COVID had decelerated or had impacted um, the, the um, market integration process, I would say that in principle, we have not seen such a, uh, a concern. On the contrary, uh, we have observed a number of good developments, for example, uh, in intraday markets. Uh, I'm trying to show, it seems to go a little bit slow. Okay, here it is. Um, we've seen even uh, compared to, to the previous year and compared to the year before, we have seen a steady increase uh, in the volumes of uh, intraday through single, single uh, market coupling, both in terms of volumes, but also in the level of cross zonal exchange in this time frame. So this illustrates with an example that the uh, market integration process uh, is continuing at pace, despite, of course, the disruptions of uh, the pandemic. I will now move to, well, in particular, to show um, what are the, the, the um, main progress that we have observed uh, in 2019 and also in recent years. So this is a hopefully dynamic animated chart, at least for me, it is, uh, hopefully for the audience as well. Uh, where you have observed how uh, market coupling has extended uh, both for the ahead and intraday to a large majority of countries in Europe. And this came together with an increase uh, in the efficient use of uh, cross zonal capacity in the both time frames. Um, in this respect, uh, it is good uh, to make a remark um, that there is a reason for concern with regards to the completion of the ahead market coupling. In, part, uh, in particular, given the delays that have been observed in the implementation of flow base, uh, which uh, has been delayed for a number of uh, in a number of occasions and is a recurring delay, together with the final integration of the coexisting market coupling projects. This is one of the areas of concern that we want to highlight, and there is an urgent need to finalize such a project. Hopefully, I can. Apologize for the slight delay. There seems to be a small time lag. Time lag. Uh, so I. Yeah. Um, maybe equally equally relevant, or, or as a summary of um, all all the pre all all what was said in previous slide, uh, we can illustrate with one single chart what is the actual achievement or the actual level of efficiency in the use of the interconnectors across the different time frames. We track it every year. And the chart represents the level of efficient use uh, in the day ahead intraday and balancing. And as mentioned in the slide, uh, while in day ahead and intraday uh, there has been significant progress in balancing, there is still quite significant room for improvement, which is, on the other hand, understandable given that we are still in the early implementation of the balancing time frame. And it is expected that with the uh, establishment of the different platforms following the approval of a number of methodologies by the agency, uh, so now TSOs are working on the process to make it happen and to also increase the level of exchange and efficient use of capacity, first to finalize the ahead intraday, but also in the balancing time frame uh, where it is start, still starting. I would like now to start sharing a number of challenges um, that um, we bring every year um, to the report, just to highlight what could be the main barriers or the main aspects that require improvement. A first obvious one that um, um, is well known to, to the audience possibly uh, is the identification of the insufficient uh, cross zonal capacity uh, leading to set the minimum target of 70% in the clean energy package. In this respect, I would like to start first with sort of a good uh, an improvement, which uh, is, is illustrated with this example in, in Central West Europe. 
I would spare from the technical details uh, because the, the chart is, is, is a bit technical, but um, in essence, uh, it represents an improvement towards uh, this, uh, the achievement of the 70%, which is still modest, um, but still is a step in the right direction. Uh, it also uh, implies that there is quite still significant room for improvement, but uh, some um, steps taken in this region uh, um, uh, came with, uh, with an improvement. Yeah. Uh, so what is the agency uh, doing uh, with regards to the 70%? Even if it is not uh, our remit to uh, ensure the enforcement of the 70% uh, capacity target, we are working intensively uh, uh, to produce a dedicated report on the topic. Uh, it's a complex matter because it requires to analyze massive amount of information. But our intention here is to be able to produce a report which presents a complex matter in a simplified manner, but at the same time given sufficient level of detail for stakeholders, for member states to understand where they are with respect to the 70% fulfillment, uh, which of course can be complemented um, as it cannot be otherwise by other follow-up or uh, monitoring tasks that also NRAs and TSOs do. But uh, um, our, our main added value here probably is to be able to provide a harmonized framework or a harmonized approach to monitoring the 70% uh, target and we intend to publish a report on this covering the first semester of this year towards uh, towards the end of December. Yeah. Uh, in this context of um, the 70% target, it's always good to remind uh, that in, the, in light of the clean energy packets, member states and TSOs have a portfolio of uh, of instruments, of routes to meet the 70% target. Uh, on the one hand, TSOs can, or member states can apply um, the most obvious or a, a, an ongoing, always ongoing solution, which is of course to invest in network. Uh, but this uh, needs to be complemented with other solutions. First, because investments need to be cost efficient, so it cannot be the only solution. Um, then because uh, network investments uh, in occasions that uh, we have seen it in, in the past and still um, now uh, face uh, certain delays for various reasons. Uh, so TSOs may apply in the short term remedial actions um, such as redispatching, for example, um, and then alternatively, they can also improve the configuration of the bidding zones. This is in addition to the possibility and this is in the clean energy package, uh, as you, as the audience may well know, of certain transitory measures, such as the application of action plans or uh, derogations during a certain period. I'm trying, yeah. Uh, this is just to highlight that the agency is currently involved in most of or if not all, all this process in different manners, mostly with regards to either monitoring in the case of, of um, projects of common interest or, for example, by approving a number of methodologies related to um, cross-border uh, redispatch or um, the methodology to be applied for the bidding zone review process. Um, with regards to these two elements, on the one hand, the um, the application of redispatch. Um, what we have seen is that uh, is indeed is is a key and is necessary, uh, but at the same is at the same time is challenging in terms of on the one hand approval of the methodologies, adoption of the methodologies, uh, but also its effective implementation, uh, which um, I may summarize as being in a relatively fragile territory, um, which if um, is not uh, well implemented or effectively implemented in the way uh, we think or, or, or the clean energy packets uh, envisage to be, um, it, it may well be that actually the bidding zone review process may have to play a role uh, to address um, the existent congestions. In this respect, with regards to the bidding zone review process, we also want to clarify th that the role of the agency is essentially to approve the methodology, but um, it's fully acknowledged that the study is going to be performed by TSOs itself, themselves, and the final decision of whether to maintain or not bidding zones lies on member states. In this respect of, of um, just to bring a little bit of more monitoring to the, to the slides, um, 
uh, in terms of, of the bidding zone review, we, we made an analysis of some of the effects of uh, one of the, um, or, or the recent split of the formerly um, merged German, Luxembourg and Austria bidding zone into two bidding zones. Here we have observed on the one hand, some positive effects, uh, which still need to consolidate and will consolidate more in the future, including with the implementation of flow base, which will help to collect more benefits from this uh, split possibly. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we observed um, certain increase of capacity on some of the Austrian borders, um, connected to a decreasing uncertainty in capacity calculation and lower amount of loop flows. And it was also observed some increase in the ahead market's liquidity uh, compared to the to the year before. Um, after, and I, here I would like to make a remark that the analysis of the ahead market liquidity was after correcting the figure sufficiently well to avoid uh, certain double counting that could occur if the numbers are not considered carefully. We also looked into forward markets uh, or the evolution of forward markets liquidity and here the picture is mixed and is not as uh, say as um, positive only as in the previous slide. Uh, on the one hand we observed um, relatively um, good development or, or reasonable development with regards to German forward markets liquidity which uh, seemed to in inherit the um, high liquidity of the former big bidding zone, large bidding zone. Uh, and as you can see, it's this transition from the blue to the green um, uh, liquid uh, to the green area in this chart. However, in the case of Austria, uh, the liquidity remains at much lower levels, even though we observe a certain increase uh, in the last uh, uh, most recent dates. This is illustrated here by the Bidask spreads, which show like um, while for Germany, uh, Bidask spreads are low and as low as they were before for the large bidding zone. For Austria, the starting point was actually a relatively high or quite high uh, Bidask spread. Though, as I mentioned, it is observed an improvement, and an improvement that could actually be comparable to liquidity, to the levels of liquidity in other markets. But of course, this improvement, if such, needs to be um, observed or tracked further over, over, over time. I will now move to one of the, um, or the, the, the other final challenge that we always uh, report in our, um, uh, in, in, in our volume on electricity wholesale, and it refers to uh, the need to uh, improve coordination uh, in the area of adequacy. Uh, we here we fully acknowledge um, the legitimate um, interest of member states of preserving, safeguarding uh, security of supply. At the same time, we observe that there is still room uh, for further coordination in, in this area, in particular when it comes to adequacy assessments. Um, and here one area that we have tracked uh, over the last few years is consistently there seems to be some discrepancy, not everywhere, but in some cases between the, um, the adequacy assessments and, um, and uh, the, the, capacity, the implementation of capacity mechanisms. We do this analysis based on the um, MAF result, MAF uh, analysis of ENSOI. Uh, which now will be improved or will uh, evolve uh, towards a pan-European adequacy assessment, which will play a relevant role in that respect, and it will take place the next year for the first time. Uh, just to, to emphasize that here we are aligned with uh, the EU objectives in the area of security of supply, once more acknowledging the role of member states to safeguard security, but also highlighting the possibility of uh, grasping ben or, or collecting benefits from uh, more coordination and mutual reliance uh, in this area. Maybe to conclude, yeah. So um, just a number of high-level uh, conclusions and recommendations. So on the one hand, we um, have seen that um, electricity markets are key for a number of political objectives, including uh, the internal energy market itself, but also. Uh, the objective of decarbonization at the lowest possible cost. Um, we, we see that progress has been made, but there is still, or we are still far from uh, finalizing the, the fully integrated electricity market. We also want to highlight the need of uh, keeping the focus on network codes and clean energy package implementation, and actually even emphasizing the need for an effective implementation. So as we usually say, not only tick the box, that is not only things are done, but things should be done 
effectively and efficiently to uh, improve market functioning and market integration. Uh, as highlighted, one of the con main areas of, of concern is the urgent need to finalize the flow-based market coupling project together with the integration of the ve various market coupling projects that still co coexist. And in the area of security supply, I, I, as I have just said, to perform robust adequacy assessments and strive to ensure improved price signals before resorting to capacity markets. Um, maybe a final slide, which is um, a bit of advertisement, but also a forward-looking uh, information. We are working, and this applies in general to all volumes, not only to electricity, but also to gas and possibly to the retail um, sections to enlarge the scope of our activities, um, to touch upon uh, other topics that uh, possibly we have not done so thoroughly in the past. Um, first, we, we, we also want to mention, as we, it was already highlighted before, that we'll publish soon a standalone report on the share of cross zonal capacity um, to, um, towards meeting the 70% target. This will happen in December this year. It will be our first report, followed by regular monitoring on this area. And over time, we, um, we intend progressively to incorporate a number of, uh, of new topics uh, that are mostly the reflection on the one hand of aspects that are in the clean energy package, but also uh, the possibility to do more um, horizontal uh, analysis, including relationship between electricity and gas wholesale markets, uh, and also enhancing the retail market monitoring. As I finish with retail market, I think it's an excellent uh, phrase to uh, give the floor to Ang, who will take over for the next part of the slides. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rafa. Uh, and yes, uh, I'm very pleased to be able to present some of the main findings in the retail uh, and the consumer protection volume. And it's actually the first time we have a consolidated version, both for retail and consumer uh, protection. And I think that's good because this is the two sides of the same coin. And as you have already understand, the other volumes as well, of course, this is based on 2019 data. So we don't have uh, yet seen the impact of the clean energy package implementation. There is a lot of new rules coming in there and we, we don't see the full impact of the COVID-19 either. But uh, just to give you... Oops, I was a bit too fast. Uh, some uh, findings, at least, we have in the report regarding the, the, the COVID-19 situation. And we see that uh, NRAs have uh, taken some measures uh, to be ordered to both protect consumers, but also, of course, to protect uh, suppliers in this uh, in this crisis. And consumers, that's the focus has mainly been to avoid this connection. And for suppliers, of course, we don't want them to go bust. So the, we, there has been measures taken in some uh, member states to mitigate the, the, the short uh, term cash flow uh, challenges. But of course, we have a very diverse situation throughout Europe and we haven't seen uh, sort of the full uh, sort of the, the end of this yet. So, so we will continue, of course, to monitor this. Moving in then to electricity and looking at prices, we see um, a large variation of, of prices throughout Europe. Um, and uh, we have seen, if we speak uh, more generally, we, we have seen both for uh, household consumers, but also for industrial users, we ha have actually seen a slight increase in prices uh, compared to last, uh, to, to 2018. But there is a, for a big uh, difference throughout Europe. Uh, for households, for example, we have the highest prices in Germany, 28.8 euro cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and that's a big difference compared to Bulgaria, where households consumers only pay 9.8 euro cents per kilowatt hours. And we have even greater variation if we look at the industrial market. Um, on average, uh, industrial consumers pay the most in Denmark, 22. Uh, 0.2 euro cents per kilowatt hour uh, compared to Luxembourg where it was the cheapest 4.9 euro cents per kilowatt hour. And we also have uh, the energy contracting parties uh, in the report, I didn't say that, but we also have here some uh, comparison uh, in relation to them.
nothing is happening when I'm trying to move. Okay, here, here we go. <laughs> here we go uh, on gas, uh, moving on to gas then. Um, gas prices actually increased uh, for household consumers, but decreased for industrial uh, users uh, during uh, 2018. But also here we see a large variation uh, throughout the union. Uh, uh, the highest price was paid in my country, Sweden, uh, 11.8 euro cents per kilowatt hour. And that's almost three times as high as uh, the households paid in Romania, 3.4 uh, euro cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, so, um, and the industrial market, we also see a big difference. Denmark uh, has the highest price, while the consumers in France, uh, the, not the consumers, but the, the industrial consumers, they have the, the, the lowest price. And the energy contracting parties, they paid, uh, uh, household consumers paid uh, on average 2.15 and industrial paid 3.8 euro cents. So it's a, a bit, uh, so it's different there uh, compared to, to the EU. To understand the competitiveness of uh, retail markets, it's, it's of course uh, uh, very important to understand how well they are mirroring the, the wholesale markets. And we see, of course, uh, that there is a link between the wholesale and retail, and that's good. But there is also uh, some, uh, some features in the retail markets that sort of uh, indicate the market is maybe not working super good. What we see is that there is a gap, of course, between the ones. Um, that is something we call the markup. Uh, and the gap actually widens uh, when prices uh, goes down and sort of uh, becomes more narrow when prices go up. So um, um, it sort of the retail market is more responsive uh, when, when prices go up uh, compared to when prices go down. So up like a rocket and down like a feather. This is nothing uh, unusual for markets, but, but still this is, uh, and it's a bit worrying if you look at gas there, you see that the gap is actually, it's going, the, 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 uh, they're going in, in, in the opposite direction. And, and the differences, uh, if you compare uh, 2019 with 2018, I think that the gap has actually widened that goes for both electricity and for gas. Uh, what we can see is also that the contestable part of uh, what the consumers pay, uh, the, uh, the energy price, uh, the contestable part actually goes down. And that's a trend that has been uh, for many years now. And I think if you compare 2008 with 2019, there is uh, the, the, the contestable part has actually the, uh, fell 9.4%. So a 9.4% decrease. What we see is also, of course, that uh, subsidies and levies for renewables is increasing if we look at electricity. If we look at gas, we see that network charges uh, has increased uh, compared to 2012. The bill is, of course, an important vehicle for consumers, uh, not only to be able to, to find out what they have to pay, but also to have, get other information. And here you see um, uh, that there is a large uh, amount of information in the bills in Europe. Uh, this differs, of course, a lot. Uh, billing cycles differ, but also what's in the bill actually differs. Um, but it's, it is, of course, important here that as the, the bill is a, um, a tool for the customers in order to find out if they can gain something to, for example, change supplier, it is important that uh, it, they, are, it's, they are not overwhelming consumers, that consumers can make good use of, of the information. And it would be, of course, interesting to follow the implementation of the clean energy package here. We see have data for next year, and we have uh, much more rules on bills in, in the clean energy package. So uh, moving on to sort of retail market functioning, and it's a bit disappointing, I think, that overall we can say that the markets are not developing fast enough or towards more well-functioning markets fast enough. Um, we have uh, some, um, though still we have some, some sort of good signs, uh, the number of, the average number of 
nationwide supplies actually increased in 2019. And this has been the trend now for some years, but it, it is uh, going quite slow. Um, market concentration levels also have improved, but, but slowly. And of course, it differs a lot also here. Uh, some um, uh, member states have very high concentration uh, ratios, while others have quite a lot of suppliers and, and quite good sort of um, quite well functioning and then quite good com competitive pressure uh, on the resale market. And of course, uh, price intervention is something that um, that uh, con uh, that um, uh, is hampering uh, both participation of customers, but, but of course also it creates barriers to entry. And of course, if uh, we have uh, price interventions that goes below uh, cost, that creates a huge uh, hurdle. Um, and in those member states, we don't see any any movement when it comes to new newcomers entering into the market. Of course, here uh, in relation to to the Price interventions. We will, of course, it will be interesting to monitor the impact of the clean energy package. Uh, price comparison tool is something important for customers uh, because it reduces search costs for customers, and they will be able to find out if they can change, if they can benefit from uh, switching suppliers. It's a very good thing. And here you see uh, this on, on the screen, you see that uh, it, mo almost all uh, countries have uh, comparison tools, at least uh, one when it comes to electricity, not that many when it comes to gas. But, uh, and you see that in some uh, member states, there, uh, there are a lot of, of uh, comparison tools. Uh, I guess they are um, uh, commercial ones. But uh, there are also ones that is run by, by the NRAs. So this is an area, uh, of course, that we will follow uh, also in the future. There are new rules also uh, in the clean energy package here as well. Oops. Uh, so, uh, smart meter rollout uh, is, of course, uh, something very important. Uh, not, uh, it's important if you want to know uh, how much you consume, uh, but of course, also if you are want to move into the next step, uh, being able to uh, become more ac uh, even more active than just changing suppliers, uh, moving into areas as uh, maybe responding to dynamic pricing uh, hour by hour or uh, a demand side response scheme or or be becoming a prosumer here the 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 smart meter is a key and there is an ongoing rollout uh, of course but uh, it may be not uh, that fast you see on 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 the on the figure here that uh, there are some countries where the, the rollout is uh, uh, completed while in in some countries uh, nothing actually has happened so it it varies a lot here as well. Uh, it's of course important that uh, consumers can uh, be protected uh, and, and not be disconnected. Uh, and here we see we don't see any big movement compared to uh, to last uh, year we measured 2018. Um, but um, energy poverty is. is Score, of course a problem in in some member states and and not very many countries have uh, have actually defined this officially so we will see of course here also with new rules what will happen um and also of course uh, the covid crisis and, and the impact here is, uh, uh, is is will also be interesting to follow but but for 2019 we we have the pretty much the same data and, and the same numbers of, of this connection as, as uh, previous year. Finally, consumer protection uh, is it's also very important, of course, that you can complain if you are uh, not satisfied. Uh, and and uh, European consumers file a lot of complaints, uh, of course, to their suppliers and to their DSOs. 
not so many are registered by the NRAs or by, by the uh, ombudsman or alternate uh, dispute resolution mechanisms. But uh, if, if we still have some data and you can see that uh, the, the one, the number one is complaining uh, about your uh, bill or your invoice, and the second uh, most common is uh, complaining about metering. So that was all uh, from the retail side, but I'm of course happy to take uh, any questions uh, in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anne, and indeed uh, also thanks to Bart and Rafa for going, taking us through the uh, through the the three different volumes: electricity wholesale, uh, well, gas wholesale, electricity wholesale, and retail and consumer protection. Um, we have uh, the pleasure of uh, Florian and Jan from the European Commission, who would try to put uh, some of these findings and highlights into the perspective of of future EU policy priorities. I think we have accorded you. Um, roughly 10 minutes for that. I, I, if you can just uh, maybe not use all 10 minutes, uh, if, if possible, so we have a bit of time for the Q&A, uh, but I would start by passing the floor to you, Florian, and then subsequently to Jan after you. Over to you. Are you with us, uh, Florian? Um... Maybe I'll just ask you, David, uh, do you have a connection with Florian or Jan? We can also start with Jan if, if Florian is facing a few connection problems, maybe. Uh, I don't I don't see them in the system. Apparently, they haven't been able to join. Aha. Yet. OK. Right. Then uh, while we wait, uh, maybe if we start uh, tackling some of the questions, uh, David, if you would reach out in the meantime to Florian and Jan and just to check um, uh, the technical availability, so to speak, uh, of the two. Um, yes. um, um, then I would uh, maybe we can we can start a bit um, and uh, I would maybe um, we have a, a number of, of questions posed uh, via um, the chat option, and I would be suggesting that um, we, we uh, I try to group them a little bit in terms of subject matter. Um, and I think there, there were at least two questions which revolved around sort of the, the COVID-19 situation and this fairly unprecedented set of circumstances impacting all walks of life, uh, including uh, energy markets in Europe. Uh, there was a question about um, uh, I think negative prices uh, experienced quite significantly uh, across Europe and, and even more so in certain jurisdictions. Maybe Rafa, you could tackle that. That was, I think, posed by Yannick uh, Fulpin. And uh, I think he was referring then also to um, uh, some generators uh, uh, bidding into the market uh, at, at prices below their costs uh, because of subsidies. Maybe this is a reference to capacity markets in place. Maybe Rafa, you could try to tackle that. And then there was a question, I think it was the eighth question posed, um, which concerned uh, this issue of a switch from coal uh, to renewables, or at least from coal to, to lower carbon uh, sources, and whether that uh, was linked to ETS prices, uh, or perhaps the rapid drop in demand with zero marginal cost being, uh, shall we say, uh, preferential in the market or what. And maybe Bart, if you would have a go at that, we could do that as the first round, and then we could uh, tackle the next round uh, of questions uh, which uh, I, I, there were a few some quite specific slide questions, which maybe Rafa, uh, you could pick up, but I'll introduce them in a second. Would that be okay, Rafa, you start, and then Bart, uh, you could uh, take the, the next question. Over to you. Okay, um, thank you, Christian. Um, may, maybe you have to repeat me the second question, but from the first one that I, um, I, I will start with um, the question on, on um, negative prices. So a priori, the way we see um, is that in itself, negative prices is just a reflection of, of market fundamentals being reflected in, in prices. Um, and the same as, um, well, there is an advocate in general in the clean energy packets to allow for prices to reflect the scarcity um, at times of, um, for example, very tight margins of generation. This is in a way the converse or the reverse situation when you have uh, very little demand and you have a high infit of, of renewables. In that respect, it's not in itself or per se, it's not a sign of bad functioning or ill functioning, 
what is true, and I think that this is um, about uh, how the question comes about, is that if, if this is sustained over, over the long run without um, some changes, for example, in the subsidies schemes or the subsidy schemes do not adapt to new realities to make renewables more integrated in the market, this may become a problem. And I think that this is where the clean energy package put some emphasis in trying to seek uh, renewable schemes which uh, make those effects to appear less and less, eventually incentivizing to renewables uh, to reduce, and, and as any other generator, um, they're in fit at times of negative prices, not to worsen the situation. In that respect, we also would see it as good. But as a general principle, uh, we uh, wouldn't see like negative prices like uh, something negative in itself. It's more like the long term, if there are no, it's not accompanied by other measures. I, I think that there was a um, second, maybe, maybe uh, uh, Christian, would you be able yes. to, yeah, yeah, to repeat yeah, the, yeah. the second question for me? Yeah. Yes, thanks, Rafa. I think I would suggest that maybe Bart, uh, if oh, yeah. you would be okay with trying to tackle that, it was around this switch from coal to renewable, to some extent also from coal to gas, and whether the ETS pricing was a main driver or perhaps other market dynamics. I don't know if you want to have a go with that, uh, Bart, and then I understand from David uh, offline that at least Jan from the Commission uh, is here, and then maybe after you answer the question, Bart, or try to, to address the question, we could pass the floor uh, to Jan to see, possibly supplemented by Florian, Otherwise, Jan will do the Commission's talking uh, in uh, its entirety. Over to you, uh, Bart. Yeah, the question was whether we can link the switch between coal-based generation to ETS prices, and what level uh, was this uh, switch in the price? So, well, the prices have gone up um, to more than 20, probably also a result of the market stability reserve, which cuts the oversupply. Uh, this was or is to the benefit of the of gas generation. Uh, we have not analyzed what the actual uh, threshold is or what I mean for sure from 20 euro per ton. Uh, that will be already putting things in motion. But we, we have to be aware that there are uh, many factors uh, at play. No, uh, so it's very it's market specific. Uh, it's also a question on the fuel prices. Uh, for example, gas prices went down, so that helped, of course, in terms of uh, the dark spread, uh, uh, prof the clean uh, spark spread. Uh, so the CCGT profitability being uh, better, uh, as opposed to uh, coal profitability. Uh, it's also a question of the uh, efficiency of the individual power plants. So uh, I wouldn't be saying this is the X euro, but uh, for sure uh, there has been a positive uh, influence. Uh, and in, uh, for example, Germany, it's still also the thermal plants that set uh, the price, even though there's already a lot of renewables. I think that would be my answer to this question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bart, and thanks, Rafa. Uh, then before we tackle some of the next uh, rounds of questions, I would pass the floor to you, Jan, uh, possibly supplemented by Florian if he manages uh, to uh, gain access uh, and unmute and so forth. Um, uh, do, would you uh, present some views, Jan, from uh, the point of view of the Commission as to some of how these findings relate to future EU policy priorities? Over to you. Yeah, I can't. I can't actually hear you. Um, I wonder, David, are they unmuted? Uh, is Jan unmuted? Uh, we are trying to work it out. I, I would recommend continue with the Q and A uh, while we solve it. Okay. Okay. No problem. Why don't we say we continue with the with the Q and A, and you let me know offline. Uh, whether Jan and, and Florian or Florian uh, are um, um, able to participate, would that be all right? Yes, thank okay. You. All right. So uh, we'll move to a, the, a second round of questions, which I have tried to group uh, a little bit. Uh, these are rather specific. Um, there was a question uh, put uh, by Paul. There, there's a bit of a, uh, a bit of an echo. Could, could those, not, could those who are not speaking please mute themselves? Okay. 
David, so, David, uh, we'll David, uh, David, could you please, uh, can you mute, uh, or Andrea, can you mute those that are not speaking? Hi, it's, um, it's Lauren here. Um, David, let, let me know. Um, I, I, I was, uh, let's take the second round of questions uh, whilst we find out um, how we uh, engage with Florian and Jan. Uh, Andrea or uh, David, can you mute uh, every other speaker than me? Okay. Um, why don't we take a second round of questions? Um, so there are some specific questions uh, as to uh, some of the slides. Um, Rafa, maybe you can see what you can address uh, some of them. Um, there was one, uh, I think, uh, which reversed sort of the, the um, shall we say, the difference between availability margin and margin available for cross-zonal trade, which was one of the things that you were mentioning. Um, there was another uh, question, I think, from, from uh, Sultan Gulay, if I pronounce that correctly, about the density function that you were also um, touching upon, uh, and uh, from Yannick uh, Fulbin about which delivery year on a, on a certain slide. I think that was the the sixth question which was posed by chat or something like that. Would you have a go at some of those, Rafa? And in the meantime, we can figure out whether the commission can join us. Over to you, Rafa. Absolutely. So indeed, indeed, they are, they are a bit technical, but they are relatively straightforward to answer. Uh, so on the first one, uh, without going into all the technicalities, indeed, the chart that was shown in the slide about uh, the remaining available margin in Central West is not exactly the same as the margin available for capacity. It, this is actually mentioned in the slides and also in the report explained very well. The main point of bringing it there in the absence of a full-fledged monitoring of uh, the margin available for uh, cross zonal capacity that will come only later, uh, towards the end of the year, it was to actually show some of the improvements that were observed Hello? for exchanges within uh, the Central West uh, region. Um, with regards to the to the well the density function, without going into the maths, because uh, yeah, I mean I, 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 it will not be um, reasonable to explain it now. But this essentially is the the um, frequency of the distribution or the frequency of occurrence of um, uh, of uh, the different levels of margin available of capacity. Uh, as a percentage of thermal capacity in this region uh, and taking the minimum value each hour. So this is what this figure represents uh, and it's explained possibly better in the in the report. With regards to the delivery of the capacity markets, uh, for, from the top of my mind, if not mistaken, this is 2019 delivery, um, which of course uh, leaves out other deliveries, but the intention here was to have sort of comparability across Europe, which we always have like a, a priority. Um, yeah, and, and then that, that means that some of other costs are left out uh, and would be incorporated prog progressively. But just to have a sort of a common currency or a common comparison, we, we use the same uh, GR uh, every report. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rafa. Um, whilst we're still trying to figure out uh, how best to involve our uh, colleagues from the Commission, um, there is a third round of questions. And again, Rafa, you seem to be a little bit in, in the crosshairs here in a positive sense, of course. Um, and um, I think these there were a, a sort of a, a group of questions uh, which revolved around um, I think it was a redispatch uh, a balancing markets um, and maybe also issues around broader liquidity. I think of hubs market concentration. There was a question by Paul uh, uh, Gispert, whom I, I, I am a frequent reader of on LinkedIn. Uh, I think that was the second question. Um, there was a question, I think, from, again, from, uh, from Yannick Fulpin about uh, redispatch um, and um, some delays in, uh, shall we say, coordinated re redispatch, which, which may be tackled by these uh, decisions which are coming up, uh, which we are heavily involved in, of course. And there was a third question, again, by Paul about balancing markets and the different approaches seen across member states. Would you try to tackle those three whilst we uh, figure out whether our commission colleagues uh, might be able to, to join us? Uh, back to you. I think you are on mute, Rafa, actually. I think you may be muted. Thank you, uh, indeed. Uh, so yeah, I, um, I, I, I also follow Paul Gisbert. Um, um, so I, I, I think we, we know each other. Uh, so thank you, Paul, for the question. Uh, I, I think that there was, there, you posed two questions at least. Um, 
one was uh, with um, I think it, it's you already brought it in, in previous occasions, which is a very fair question: is why there are differences between the gas and the electricity wholesale volume with regards to some indicators. Uh, I, I think I would give the same answer as in previous years. In a way, is that um, um, it, it's it's, um, it's, it's a, for a, for a set of reasons. First, is a, um, a conscious decision to put the focus. Um, of the different volumes where we believe that we give more added value. Um, in gas, there has to be a focus uh, also because of the um, um, GTM, so the metrics for the gas target model uh, on, for example, certain indicators such as concentration or such as uh, liquidity. Uh, we do similar things to some extent in electricity, for example, with regards to liquidity that we did not did, uh, do in the past and we do it more and more, among other reasons, uh, following some of your suggestions. However, when it comes to, to concentration, um, our understanding is that um, uh, monitoring concentration in electricity markets is different from gas, uh, mainly because every market time unit leads to a different situation, being almost, if you like, a different market. And you would need to go into a set of different uh, indicators, such as residual supply index, which from a, um, for an European report would be possibly out of the scope. So I think that there is a number of reasons, uh, but mostly is that we are convinced that we, we should put efforts where we have more added value and where other institutions being national regulators are able to do better, for example, on concentration, uh, we understand that this is better served uh, in that way. You also mentioned about balancing. Uh, there is, there is, um, it's not that we have a full-fledged report on balancing, but we, we do have a chapter dedicated to balancing that mostly refers to the... I think that there is some... I think it's... Can I, can I maybe ask uh, Andrea, David, uh, to meet everyone except Rafa? It's not that we have a full-fledged report on balancing, number of patients, Hi, I think someone is connected here. Yes. Shall I try to continue with some background? Maybe it's better. I, I think now it now it it muted. Okay, great. Uh, so on balancing, we, we have a chapter dedicated to balancing. We put emphasis there in the level of cross-border exchange of balancing. Um, and we also um, take some features of, of the national market design, but it's not a full fledged analysis because, as said, at some point we have to make choices between, for example, focusing on cross-border aspects, focusing on absolutely every single um, development in the, in the market. One element that we, for example, brought this year is the need or the um, benefits that would bring to the functioning of balancing markets to procure balancing capacity closer to real time. And you, you may be able to find some insights on this aspect in the report, and you will see actually differences, as you pointed out, uh, in how close to real time balancing capacity is procured. Finally, there was a question, not sure if by Yannick, on, um, um, on redispatch and the challenges associated, and what would be the uh, the way forward if there are issues there, um, and the role for Acer eventually. I think it was something. I, now I'm not sure if it was one or two questions, but it was along these lines. So I mean, there indeed. I mean, we, we there is an issue with with um, with uh, the risk um, of of effective implementation of redispatch and counter trading methodologies. Um, we already observe it now during the approval process that is challenging in itself. Um, and there we, in principle, we have to respect, of course, and we will always do to respect the enforcement uh, powers of the national authorities, and we will be ready to support in whatever way it is requested from us. Uh, but this is indeed uh, national authorities and member states who are to enforce it, and it's our role to coordinate or to support when necessary. I think that I took all the questions about the topics you mentioned, Christian. Thank you.
Okay, excellent. I am now unmuted. Um, I think given the, some of the technical problems, I think we will have to um, perhaps do without the, the input from our colleagues from the European Commission. We still have a number of, uh, of questions which we would like to tackle in the remaining uh, time. Um, there were uh, a, a group of questions, uh, I think, um, focused a bit on, on retail. And I wonder, uh, Anne, if you might have a go uh, at a question from Francisco de uh, Boya Artes about smart meter rollout, and there may still be a question, which was number 12, and I think there was a question number 11 uh, about some of the key numbers about cost that may have been resolved in a bit of the subsequent back and forth on chat. If you would take that, and then maybe afterwards, uh, I'd pass the floor to you, Bart, uh, for uh, some questions uh, on gas. Uh, there was a question, I think, on long-term capacity contracts, and another um, uh, question about the role of upstream, uh, upstream producers for some of the developments in wholesale gas that you were alluding to. But we would take that, I think, as, as, a, as, a, as another round after Anne has had a chance to come in. Would that be all right, Anne? Yes, thank you, Christian. Um, uh, when it comes to the smart meter, uh, I think that uh, we don't have, uh, we can't confuse what is coming and what is or, uh, in the directive at the moment. Sort of the the clean energy package and and the directive that uh, that was uh, the one before. <laughs> so uh, there are, um, of course, rules. Uh, uh, in the directive, uh, in the clean energy package, that if uh, sort of a systematic deployment should be under um, a cost-benefit analysis. So if that one is negative, you don't have to deploy systematically. Although there are other rules in the clean energy package saying that if you as a customer would like to have a smart meter, you can actually have that on demand, although the sort of the more systematic uh, evaluation shows that uh, there is a negative cost benefit and of course if you are going to enter into a, a dynamic price contract you need that type of meter so um, my personal hope is that this uh, accelerates a bit and that many countries actually um, the, the old meters have come to their life uh, expectancy and, and that, that there will be a positive uh, cost benefit analysis because consumers need smart meters actually to be an integrated part in the market Hope that was the uh, answer to the question. I think there was another question in related to the contestable part. I don't. I think the the word price was a bit misleading. It should be the costs, and it it actually that slide showed the difference between uh, the the sort of the, the the percentage between the different components uh, on the energy bill. Indeed. Thank you very much, uh, And Now we, we turn our attention briefly, I think, to gas. There were a few questions there, Bart, if you would uh, wish to pick them up, please. I think you may be muted still, uh, Bart, actually. We'll just wait a second for uh, David and Andrea to unmute you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, the first question on uh, wholesale gas markets was mentioned, uh, the role of upstreamers uh, is higher in longer term capacity bookings to expand on uh, this point. So um, here it's true that uh, upstreamers uh, are more active. Uh, let's take a step back. Uh, it's because the midstreamers are less active for these longer term uh, capacity bookings. So um, uh, they want to take uh, less risk uh, and try to focus more on the shorter term. And the upstreamers, we see uh, a lot of activity on selected uh, lines uh, of, of, of pipes better. Um, for us, potentially in the future is the question uh, of future concentration uh, uh, levels, but they are taking over the role of the midstreamers. And then on the other question, which was, um, what is your expectation when most long-term contracts expire and impact on tariff pancaking and cross-border trade uh, uh, in gas? Yeah, so here uh, it's a bit uh, maybe a more complicated uh, question. Um, when long-term uh, contracts expire, they free up uh, capacity uh, that when it's booked uh, as opposed to what we have in terms of uh, legacy contracts, uh, it makes it more uh, efficient uh, in terms of uh, booking. However, the current 
system where you could bid uh, along short-term marginal uh, costs uh, will be less and less uh, involved uh, then. So this is a, a mechanism or a thing that uh, helps also to uh, in the convergence of prices, but over time this may reduce. So the impact there could be depending uh, on markets where it functions well, uh, we think that convergence will uh, remain. On others, the spread could uh, potentially increase uh, again. Um, yeah, so that depends on the location then whether the whether there will be a bit more tariff pancaking than uh, what is now the case in terms of what you uh, are asking on the uh, pancaking question. So. More efficient bookings with uh, less uh, legacy contracts, uh, older systems of uh, market uh, uh, ways of doing uh, will decrease. The impact is quite uh, specific uh, to markets and even pipes. Um, we will need to see what happens. Okay, that's my contribution. Uh, next, to you, over to you, uh, Christian. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Bart. I think uh, given uh, time, we'll just have one uh, final round of, of uh, questions which we'll seek to address. Um, it may have been a bit optimistic to try to address all questions um, in this session, but I think we'll do one final round, uh, merging a bit, uh, a couple of questions. Um, and once again, Rafa, I think you, you're, you're up a bit here. Um, one, I think, was a question around sort of the 70% uh, um, target by Gonzalo uh, Madayan uh, about how regular we would envisage that. Uh, I, after that, I would try to maybe address uh, a question around the bidding zone review and, shall we say, the uh, uh, the, the, the ultimate outcome, given the role of member states, etc. And then maybe we could close with a few of, I think, the final questions, some of the final questions put uh, to us, which was around sort of broader market developments. There was this about the role day ahead versus balancing markets, which I think was question number 14 by Axel uh, Butson. And then Ruth Otta had a question about sort of the increased cross-border trade that we see in day ahead and intraday. Maybe if you have a few thoughts on that towards the very end, Rafa, and then we turn to Engret uh, for some concluding remarks acknowledging uh, that some questions we could not tackle in the time allowed. Would that be all right, Rafa, that you, you, you kick off with the first one, and then I, I try to address um, the one on the bidding zone review. Over to you. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, indeed. So the intention is to produce, uh, to the extent possible, this report every six months, so half yearly. Uh, this is the first occasion we do it. Uh, we understand that at least at the beginning there is a need to do this regular monitoring because it's kind of a new kicking in target. So it's important to keep the update, to track the updates, to see difficulties, identify difficulties from the beginning. So that's the intention. I also have to say that it's very demanding in terms of resources. So I will do it as long as resources allow. Uh, at the moment, we don't have any reason to believe that this is not possible, but it, it, there, there could be also a dependency there between workload and how we can go about it. Otherwise, we might have to, to shift to yearly, but for the time being, the intention is half yearly uh, reporting. Thank you very much, uh, Rafa. Then uh, there was a question by uh, Benjamin uh, Genet, if I pronounce that correctly, um, around sort of the, the the process or perhaps the outcome of the bidding zone review that you, Rafa, you were you were um, taking us through a bit earlier on uh, in the webinar. Um, and the way I would uh, maybe try to address that is, um, I think it's it's a, it's a common uh, perception that the the first uh, bidding zone review uh, was uh, perhaps not as uh, well developed and and sound as it might have been. And so our approach for uh, this betting song review is to have as uh, a technically sound, um, well-developed uh, review process as possible, uh, knowing that that will probably also be uh, necessary in order for member states as the ultimate deciders to, um, to, to really really thorough, uh, thoroughly evaluate uh, the different options for the bidding zone configurations. I think if uh, member states are uh, perhaps not fully convinced that it, the, the uh, exercise done has been thorough, uh, technically very proficient, uh, very um, thorough, um, uh, diligent, uh, neutral, etc., uh, there is perhaps uh, less room to look carefully at the different options. So we think it is an important process, not just in terms of how it relates to broader objectives, uh, but also in terms of providing member states with sort of the, the, the fullest available uh, information in order for them to assess different options going forward. Uh, so that is an important uh, uh, deliverable in the years ahead. 
I think we'll close uh, with just a few points maybe on this uh, interplay of, of, of markets, uh, Rafa, question 14 and question uh, 17, uh, balancing versus day ahead, how we see that in the future developing, and, and this increase in cross-border trade day ahead and intraday. Do you have any final thoughts on that wrap-up before we pass the floor to Engret to conclude? Over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um... On the on the uh, question about balancing, if I, um, I'm, I'm trying to read, yeah, so um, uh, this is from Craig. And actually, they mentioned that uh, balancing price prices have been much ahead than day ahead prices uh, due to lack of availabilities of gas fire power plants and lower day ahead prices. And if we see this as a future to uh, be recurrent in the future. I think it, it cannot be excluded, actually. I mean, as, as long as, uh, and, and in a way, I think that probably the, the, the the trick or the, the um, important element is to keep a balance between uh, having the right price signal. So if indeed, if there is some scarcity of resources or flexible resources at certain point in times, is on the one hand natural that there is some, there are some tensions on, on prices, but at the same time, it has to be carefully assessed and in this respect remit, but also other, other applicable regulation may help to exclude that there is some sort of market power leading these, these, two, these tensions in, in those tensions on prices. Uh, so this is how I would see it. Uh, and then the other question was about if we have any thoughts or, or insight on what are the reasons for increasing um, day ahead and intraday trading. Uh, well, if it is if it is just simply like overall volumes through Europe, I think that there is a possibly a, a move or um, uh, in, there are some markets that were not mature enough in the past, so they're still maturing and possibly there is a move uh, to, uh, to, for example, trade through the power exchange as opposed to bilateral trading in a certain manner because markets are becoming more mature in that respect or more transparent, if you like. Uh, in intraday, I think it's possibly a consequence of uh, more renewables coming online. Uh, that's a clear trigger of more uh, intraday trades. Um, but also um, the level of integration. I think that the level of integration clearly plays a role. Uh, particularly for intraday markets. I think that uh, even if intraday markets, there were like many challenges to get it kick started, like the process. Uh, I mean, we have seen, and it was one of the charts that uh, the intraday continuous trading has um, increased significantly over the last few years. That would be my reply to that. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much, Rafa. Um, then I would um, um, uh, maybe pass the floor for some concluding remarks from Engret. Regretting, of course, we do not have time to to hear from Florian and, and Jan. Uh in part due to technical difficulties. We'll evaluate a little bit on that for, for upcoming occasions, but um, I pass the floor to you, Engret, a few minutes uh, later than I had expected, but hopefully <laughs> you can wrap this up somehow with some concluding insights, uh, also building on these very many questions that we had. Over to yes, you. Yes, indeed. <laughs> okay, thank you, Christian, and uh, no problem. Uh, indeed, I think uh, we, we, the question showed uh, how relevant all uh, the money, market monitoring is in, in all respects with all the different uh, elements and aspects uh, of it uh, on the wholesale level, on the, uh, on the retail level, on the consumer side, on uh, electricity side, gas side. Uh, and also, uh, it showed um, the, the uh, interaction and the relevance uh, with regard uh, to the framework. Um, and in particular, as we, as we heard, uh, COVID, uh, the, the impact of COVID, I think, um, was uh, limited because uh, markets in their uh, current, uh, based on, on, the, on the framework, on a sound framework, uh, worked worked well, uh, and of course we have seen that uh, more um, is to be done uh, for the integration of the national markets into the uh, into a more integrated uh, internal energy market. That is one integration. The second integration surely is uh, increasing uh, share of uh, renewables to be integrated um, uh, at, uh, in, in, a, in an efficient way and in, in the grid as well as in the markets. And uh, it was mentioned several times that uh, we see that prices are reacting, which is a good sign. Of course, negative uh, prices uh, indicate that there is abundance and that was a uh, consequence uh, of uh, the um, decrease in demand uh, during COVID times. But however, 
uh, that is, and, and that uh, also then uh, had implications on the other market side, the share of renewables increased. Uh, so I think, again, the, the market is functioning, but we also see that uh, the instruments uh, laid out in the clean energy package uh, need uh, to kick in uh, to uh, ensure that uh, the mechanisms uh, become uh, better and the barriers that still uh, exist um, are reduced. With this, I come to the, let's say, third integration, that is the integration of an active uh, co uh, consumer uh, in the market, in the retail market, uh, but also, let's say, in bro more, speaking more broad broadly in the system. Uh, to ensure that we that we are not seeing any more this um, let's say split uh, or between wholesale market developments where we see the development is is working well as it should, uh, also with the implementation of network codes etc cetera, etc, cetera, a market coupling uh, or by it's still still to, to to we have still to go uh, away. Um, but the, not all the benefits of this uh, positive developments are trickling down uh, to or are passed through uh, to, to consumers. And that is something which is of concern, as Anne has pointed out, uh, where hopefully the instruments of the clean energy package with regard to uh, consumers and retail market becoming more powerful, becoming more uh, active, being more integrated into the system will uh, not only have positive effects for the system as a whole, but, but will, of course, hopefully also uh, bring benefits to the consumers from the energy uh, transition. And I think that is something that we have to see as a whole system approach, so to speak, uh, to ensure that consumers buy in uh, because they see the benefits of, of, for example, becoming more active when we have uh, the uh, let's say the the technology like more smart meters etc better functioning uh, of the of the rules of the system uh, more transparency for consumers we have seen the price comparison tools as an instrument which is which is fostered by the by the clean energy provisions uh, but also uh, uh, generally the um, better information regarding the energy bill all elements that can uh, make um, make sure that consumers uh, and customers can um, can take an informed uh, choice uh, if they see the benefits. And I think that is very, very important. And again, this is related uh, to a proper market functioning throughout the whole value chain, so throughout all levels of the markets. And I think that is something which we have to, to bear in mind uh, when implementing uh, the, the, the new instruments. And uh, I also uh, very would like uh, to, to mention that it is uh, important that the instruments that we have now uh, uh, new, as was uh, pointed out, the 70% target uh, and, and others, uh, need uh, to be, um, uh, let's say, implemented soon and fit in and be based uh, on the foundations of the existing market uh, design uh, in order to avoid uh, fragmentation or even a sort of, uh, uh, um, of, of um, a backlash, uh, as, as was uh, pointed out, for example, in the questions related uh, to, to the gas market uh, situation, uh, where we cannot be sure it develops in the right direction. And we also saw in the development uh, of, of retail prices uh, that uh, the gap sometimes between wholesale and retail uh, is increasing. And, and that, of course, is a sign of concern, which shows that there are existing barriers which we need to overcome by uh, swiftly implementing uh, the, the new provisions uh, and fitting it uh, together so that the system as a whole uh, can, can be, um, let's say, a tool also or a, um, a, um, a way forward uh, to ensure uh, decarbonization at least costs and to ensure also uh, that consumers uh, are not left uh, behind and that they are uh, included. So for us, the principle of inclusiveness in that context is, is very important. But uh, a, a fundamental part is 
that uh, the uh, market system uh, needs to function and the instruments that are there to, to make the, the market system better functioning, also cross-border capacity uh, market mechanisms, so etc. All of this uh, is, is an important element because the best let's say, way in the end is to, to have a, uh, an integrated, stable system uh, based on uh, functioning markets. And I think the value of these uh, principles uh, of, of uh, market, uh, of the of, uh, internal energy market legislation and the clean energy package uh, have, have proven uh, its value uh, during COVID uh, crisis. Uh, and uh, I think we need now to look ahead uh, with regard, and that was mentioned as well, uh, to the uh, further development uh, of the 10E uh, regulation, uh, looking at uh, energy uh, efficient uh, investment, uh, infra infrastructure investment, sorry, uh, and of course also, let's say, uh, ensuring that there are sustainable and green projects of common interest, so linking it with uh, the overall objectives uh, of uh, the Commission of uh, a, a decarbonization at least cost uh, that of course also relates uh, to, to the gas side, uh, plus of course let's say overall the objective uh, of uh, becoming uh, climate neutral or carbon neutral uh, by 2050 and now um, let's say also increasing the, the, car, the, 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 the climate uh, targets uh, as proposed and we are aware, we, I think we should, and that may be the, the last concluding sentence, we as regulators uh, should be aware uh, that this is absolutely necessary but that of course tightening up of the, of the targets here uh, requires uh, more um, more efforts uh, from all of us, so from uh, energy uh, operators, uh, generators, and uh, regulators, and of course also uh, the, the broader uh, politics uh, to ensure uh, it works together and uh, we, we can, let's say, make jointly uh, this, this effort to ensure uh, that the energy transition and the transition towards a, a climate and carbon neutral um, uh, economy as a whole uh, is managed uh, well and uh, achieved uh, in time uh, as, as envisaged. So I think that's uh, what I want uh, to, well, how I try to, to conclude on this very, very interesting and broad um, discussion, as well as, of course, on the, on the reporting as such, uh, showing these effects. And I think what we also had seen this time is the importance of monitoring for these future legislative developments. So to, to enable to give the Commission something at hand for an evidence-based for evidence-based proposals. I think that, that is, 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 is a relevant uh, part of the work of market monitoring. So not only backward looking, uh, but also making use of it in a forward uh, looking manner. Thanks back to you, Christian. Thanks, thanks a lot, Anna Gret. And yeah, you, you actually stole one of my very concluding remarks, which I completely <laughs> agree with what you said. No, no, it's very good. Um, I want to thank everyone for being with us. We hit the noon mark. It's a bit later than we had sort of promised, but I see that some of you have chosen to to uh, stick around. Roughly 200 of you. Uh, we appreciate that uh, a lot. Thank you for being with us. I hope you agree a bit in, in the same spirit as Anne Gret was concluding with that market monitoring remains uh, as, if not more important than ever, also as we embark upon this new and exciting, to some extent challenging phase of uh, energy market developments uh, in Europe. We tried to tackle as many questions as possible. I don't think we got around to every single one. I apologize for that. I think we got maybe 75, 80% of the questions in six or seven rounds. Um, hopefully you'll you'll forgive that. That was sort of the silver lining of the EC colleagues not being able to join us because we, we managed to tackle more questions. But of course that was a bit unfortunate and, and we'll seek next time to make sure that they are involved in a way so that, that they can give their views. I know many of you would have been looking forward to that. There's lots of information available on our respective websites, uh, obviously the reports, snapshot summaries, etc. Uh, this recording will be made available, the slides will be made available, so there is uh, lots of stuff to dive into if these roughly hour and a half have not, shall we say, fully satisfied your appetite so far. So with that, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining. Uh, David, if you have any final words to say, by all means say it. Uh, other than that, I wish you a uh, good noon, afternoon, maybe even lunch, if you're lucky enough. Thank you very much for being with us. Yes, I, I would just uh, like to thank uh, Jan and Florian that despite they couldn't join us, uh, there are some incompatibility issues with the Commission system. They were with us as attendees. 
we are very sorry. We will make sure um, next time we have a system fully compatible with the Commission. Uh, as Christian said, you will receive uh, an email including uh, the presentation, the video recording, and, and also the press release and all related materials very soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone.